back to our uh, to our angels topic and and finish that out in the next in the next few weeks while our uh, while the Bibles are being being delivered here. And let's begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Bless the Lord. We pray that you would be with us now as we hear and study your word. We pray that you would teach us to know and receive the gift of the ministry of the angels, and that you would teach us ever to look to you in our times of need. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, when we last left the angels, we were really talking a little bit more about demons than we were angels. Demons, of course, are fallen angels. And so we're going to uh, uh, we're going to finish that out. Anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> yeah, that would definitely be Flip Wilson of the Devil Made Me Do It fame. <laughs> Comedian from the 60s and 70s. Um, all right, I got to make this a little bit bigger so that I can actually read it. Seems human interest in the devil and evil in general sometimes takes a comedic twist. You're exemplified by the catchphrase by Flip Wilson. However, in reality, there's nothing funny about the devil. It's very real. Demons are, demons are very real. Demonic possession is very real. Praxis is one of the devil's better tricks. By dulling our senses with real, real danger in his minions pose, we may be more willing to take the bait. So the question, just to kind of get us uh, starting on this, is why is it that we tend to downplay uh, our fears and concerns about, about the devil and demonic activity? Why is it that that is kind of um, not taken seriously? I think I even say why much of Christianity today. Then what do you think? Modernism. Modernism. By which, what do you mean by that? Uh, the idea that everything has a naturalist interpretation. Okay. So, so because um, because I can't see, touch, taste, or feel demons, therefore they must not be real. Or because you can't do it repeatedly. <laughs> right, or, right. It, it, at most you may be talking about a one-time event, and that can easily be written off as a hallucination or some, you know, a dream or whatever. So, yeah, okay, what else? Why is it that we tend to, we tend to almost smirk at, uh, at talk of, of uh, the devil or demonic activity? Great. For Christians, it's actually a little different. I think we can downplay it a little bit because we do believe that there's a devil. We are a little afraid. <coughs> right? We know that too often he's inside of us and the decisions we make are. Sure. Sure. And, and yeah, I, I suppose that's true. Um, I, think, I think for Christians, it may be that, um, that because. Because I know that Jesus died for me, and because I know that I'm going to heaven, therefore I don't have to really take it seriously. Yeah. Right? Or I think what happens sometimes is people, we think that because God's in charge, we don't really, we like to not think that the devil has a certain power here. Sure. We think, no, no. Right. You know, God's, God's going to win anyway. We know the right. end story. Right. Or so, God is already won. Right. Therefore, so therefore, you know that can't be true, and um, yeah, or and we just don't we think that that the devil can't have that much power. Right, right. Yeah, I, it, it is. A, I think for for the for the world, you have you have kind of on the one one hand the you know all the rationalism, the fact that we're talking because we're talking about spiritual realities that that basically means it's not real. And that this is something we've kind of made up. You know, this is mythology uh, to kind of express our fears of the unknown. Um, you know, the uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke is a uh, science fiction author um, from the mid mid to late 20th century, and he had a, a phrase that any any technology can eventually become advanced enough so that it is indistinguishable from a god. Huh. So, 
and, and which is kind of an interesting idea that uh, that you know you can look at some technology and at some point, you know, to the 19th century uh, man looking at an iPad is basically going to be magic. I mean, it's going to it's going to appear like magic or or some divine thing, and so it's very easy to write off nearly anything that we don't understand and say, well, maybe that's, some, that's just some technology that I don't quite get yet. Because I don't get it, this doesn't mean that there's something else involved, that just means I don't understand it. Catherine. Well, I think also, you know, with like horoscopes or with um, fortune telling and things, there are truly so many that are just novels, that are just you know, sure. goofy, stupid, oh, absolutely. Goofy schemes or whatever. That it's easy to kind of write it off as, oh, they're all that. Right, right. Well, I mean, if you look at 20th century media, cartoons, comics, Sweet. movies, books, <laughs> etc., that that have to do with with demonic activity, you're going to have one of two extremes, I think. On the one hand, you're going to have the I'll, I'll call the Bugs Bunny demon, Sweet. right, <laughs> or Scooby Doo. <laughs> right, you know, something like that. Something that is clearly comical, right? That you know, because it's comical, it's it's meant to sort of belittle it as not being real, right? So that's kind of the one extreme. The other extreme is gonna is gonna be the uh, you know the super the super gory horror movie type thing, which is actually also comical in a different way. And, and in both of those cases, I think that you're, there, there are different ways that people try to express what they don't understand that's not real. Bethany? What does demon possession look like to you? Is it oh, that's an excellent or a killer, question. Or what? We're going to, and we're going to, we might get there today, but we're, we are going to get there. Uh, it's actually even in this, in this set of slides, so whether we get there or we can see. I think everybody knows that there, there's some kind of invisible evil force that influences them, and it's scary. Yeah. So you have to laugh at it because it's like it's back here. Right. Everyone, just like everyone, kind of knows or has some inkling that there's God. Right. And there's the good and there's an evil. Look at Star Wars. Look at right. You know, every, just about every story ever it. written has has some conflict between good and evil. Uh, some sort or another. Now, whether you know, we may argue about what whether the good is truly good and whether the evil is truly evil, but they're still dealing with a concept of right and wrong, good and evil. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Seth, no, okay. Any other kind of introductory thoughts on that? Uh, there's also this general sense of not knowing whether the influence is coming from you or whether it's external, whether it's your sinful nature. Right. Pushing you towards evil, or whether it's something else. Like yeah, we have, we we have our uh, our kind of a trio of the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature, and so it's very easy to to kind of write it off as that's just the world, or that's or that's just me. That this is not a satanic influence. I, I, and and it's interesting. I would I would argue that that. A church that does not take satanic power seriously as, as real, in the same way, will not take our Lord's power and authority real. Because they absolutely go hand in hand. We're going to look at a few verses that kind of talk about that. And I don't mean this as, a, as kind of a scare tactic. But simply, you know, we have to we have to look at how the scriptures present reality, <laughs> and and that that's not something that I can just sort of say, well, I don't think that this is right. So, what do the scriptures actually say in order to uh, teach us along the way? Okay, I think that's probably enough to get us get us started. I've got a couple verses here, and we have looked at Genesis. The, the fall of Adam and Eve a couple times, so I don't want you to look that up. But if I can have the first first few rows look up Luke eight twelve, and then the and then the. Back
back two, three rows, look up uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3. That would be great. So Luke 8, 12, and 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 3. And then, and then we'll, we'll kind of look at this in the context of the fall of Adam and Eve as well. <laughs> Anybody have Luke 8, 12, 4 up here? Everybody got it? It's kind of in the middle of the uh, parable of the sower. Just if you got it. It runs along the path of those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. All right. So, so these are the, the ones on the path that is the hard ground. Uh, heard, but then the devil comes and takes this seed that is not planted deep because it's the ground is packed, and then the devil comes and takes it away. So it's kind of an interesting picture because that most certainly portrays the devil as having some kind of power or authority, right? And these from our, our Lord's words Himself. This is His explanation of the parable. This is not the parable. This is His explanation of the parable. All right, we have somebody in the back, a couple, three rows, have the First Timothy verse for us. First Timothy four, one to three. Somebody got it, David. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry in order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Can you read one more just to round it out? Yes. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Yeah. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. All right. So, so this is this is. Paul writing to Timothy, who is his, his disciple, and, and kind of giving him pastoral advice on what it is going to be like to care for God's sheep in the years to come. Okay, that's that's kind of the broad, the broad context. And, and he is saying that in the latter days, some will depart, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves, my translation has, to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Um, and I think David said a little bit different translation, but, but you get the idea there. Lying spirits and teaching and demonic teaching. And that what that demonic teaching is going to do is going to be to forbid things that God's word allows and to allow things that God's word forbids. Let me say that one more time, and then I'll get to Tina. So this, this demonic teaching is about forbidding things that God's word allows, and allowing things that God's word, God's word forbids. So if the devil can convince God's people that, and Paul's, Paul gives two examples here, abstaining from marriage is good, and um, and not eating certain foods is good, these are the things that are a sign of your salvation, then what does that also mean? <laughs> that means that you're not actually looking at Jesus, but you're more but you're more focused in on these other extraneous matters that are matters of this world, not about eternal life. Tina and then Chris. So these people, is that like a person possessed by a demon, like kind of like what Bethany was saying mm -hmm. at certain times? Or are these demons that take human well, form? Well, in this, in this specific instance, he doesn't use uh, language about possession. No. But he's talking more specifically about teaching. Or okay. like thoughts that you would have in your head? Yeah, like I, I, I mean, if you, let, let's, again, let's take this in the context of the fall, okay? In the fall, you have the serpent 
teaching Adam and Eve that that what God says is not true, that God's word is not true, and that my word, the devil's word, is true, or that your own heart is true. Okay, that's that is the essence of satanic teaching, is to look away from God's word and to look into yourself or onto someplace else that God has not promised to be. Okay? So and, and that's why that kind of introductory things about Ouija boards and, and all of this other all of this other stuff. And there's all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament, especially, that speak against conjuring conjuring spirits and other things. And what's in essence behind that is how do I know what is true? That's that's the kind of the bottom of that question. If I learn and know what is true from where God has promised to be found in His Word. That's one. That's one answer. If I learn or know what is true from either what's in my heart or from some other ecstatic experience that God has not promised to work through, then I can't know: Is this from God? Is this from Satan? Am I just having indigestion? What's you know? What's what's going on? I mean, I. And, and I know that that is kind of comical, but if you look at at the kind of the history of these experiences, that's what's behind it, is because there has to be some sort of feeling behind it that is not grounded in the Word of God, that feeling actually trumps the Word of God. Chris, and then there were a couple of hands over here. So, you took a church like Sunday Adventist, who... Uh, preach the Trinity and stuff, but then they throw in this weird stuff like not eating meat and not and following all the sure. Old Testament laws. Sure, they're there, but aren't they? <clears throat> well, and this, this is why the church always has to be on guard to to ask the question of why we do what we do the way we do it. You know. Um, there is, for example, a really long history in the Christian church about, about fasting or about abstaining from certain foods at certain times. And that was, that was as true for Paul as it was then. The question, the question is, why are you doing these practices? And what are you hoping to gain from them? So if, so if not eating meat on a certain day is a is done as a as a physical discipline. That's one thing. If this is done because you believe that God God demands it of you, that's another that's another matter entirely. And and whenever we look at at our own practices and at the practices of other churches, that's kind of our this is really this is our barometer. Is how does this line up? Maybe a plumb line is a better example. This is our plumb line. How does this, how does this line up with what the Word of God teaches, and how does it not? That's kind of how I try to think about that. All right. There are a couple of it. Catherine, I think, and then Rick. Well, I had it so clear in my head the way you said it that the concept of any time that it is taking our faith away from looking towards Christ as our only way of salvation, right. that is a devil influence. Or that is the devil's way. And, and the way that, that, if you look at that, that is really, you know, I mean, it's easy to look at that and go, oh, sure, if I'm going and seeing a, you know, a horoscope or this or that. But, right. you know, even things like seven steps towards better living or whatever. Sure. If that is... It's interesting, you know, if I am trying to improve how I live, is that taking my eyes off Christ? <clears throat> well, the way that... You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the way that I would try to look at that is, is, is to say that we don't, um, we don't discipline our bodies. That's, kind of, that's the language that Paul uses. We don't discipline our bodies in order to gain salvation. Right. 
Okay, and, and so we're really talking about how do I, how do I live my life here today? I am not, uh, I don't discipline my body in order in, for a kind of, a, for spiritual gain, in the sense that this is going to get me in better with God somehow. That's not why. Um, I discipline my body for the sake of my neighbor. Not for my own sake, but for the sake of, for the sake of those that God has entrusted to me. For my family, for my neighbor, for, you know, whomever God puts before me. And so it really does have to do with why am I, why am I doing it? So I'm not doing it for the, for the sake of salvation. I'm doing this for the sake of my neighbor, knowing and recognizing that God uses, uses me as his instrument to take care of others in the world. And so that, that sort of puts it, puts it in, a different, in a different context that I think is important. And that's really how we look at, um, that's how we look at earthly disciplines. And, and marriage is the perfect example of that. I've been thinking about marriage a lot <laughs> because, uh, because we had two weddings while, while we were on vacation. Um, my niece... Uh, Anna, and by the way, this is my one of my other nieces, Sarah. Say hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah's visiting us for a couple weeks. Um, her sister's one that got married, and then my sister Laura, who many of you know, got married this past weekend. Um, so we've had a couple marriages. Plus, Catherine and I uh, celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. So I've been thinking about marriage, and, and sort of thinking that. A part of a part of the essence of marriage is that it is not for yourself, but it is for the other. <laughs> that you don't get married for yourself. Obviously, there are great benefits to marriage, but mar the essence of marriage is love, which means looking to the other and not to yourself. And that is very earthly. That is that is very here and now focused. And that, that puts a very different kind of spin on what marriage is and why God instituted marriage. Now, I know that's a whole other can of, uh, can of uh, something, but, uh, but, but that, I, that has some interesting implications of what we're talking about. Rick, you had your hand up about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I guess I've gone full circle during your discussion here. Okay. The first question was, how does Rome deal with this passage? Yeah. And then it came again, all right, well, the discipline issue. But now coming back to what, what is marriage and the love mean for the other person, how does Rome deal with this passage? That is a really great, how does Rome, how does the Roman Catholic Church deal with, with the forbidding marriage passages? Um, I, I don't know how precisely Rome deals with this passage, okay? So I can't answer that one for you. Broadly speaking, the way that Rome answers, because Rome does not forbid marriage, sort of categorically, right? Rome forbids marriage to priests and to, and to people in monastic orders. So their, so their argument would probably be, oh, we agree, we don't forbid marriage. Anybody can marry. You just can't be married and be a priest or a nun or a monk at the same time. So that, that is probably how they, how they would answer it. That's my Lutheran guess on that, on that question. Now, was there a follow-up to that? No. Oh, okay. Ben, and then I'll work my way back. Um, I, I read that historically the primary purpose of fasting was to give the money you would have spent on food to the poor. And you sort of lost that. Well, and that, and that, of course, gets at the, gets at the neighbor issue again, right? That, that the, purpose of, if the purpose of these things is to serve your neighbor, that's, that's one benefit. That, that kind of puts a different, a different perspective on it. Most of the time, today, when we talk about fasting, we talk about fasting as having health benefits. You know, it's just kind of a, a, a trend in, in health. Health is, you know, to, to have cleanse days and I've done all of these kinds of things before. But those are, that is different because that's not talking about how you serve your neighbor. That's talking how you take care of your, yourself. And while there, there's benefit to that, that's not the same thing as how the scriptures talk about it. Are you holding your hand up? Do you have 
question. You're just holding your arm up. Okay. Uh, Richard. Uh, taking care of your body, uh, I recall, uh, I'm always heard that your, your body is God's temple. And yep. Take care of you bet. God's it's body. also in the fall. So that doesn't seem to fit with either of your two. Well, I would, say, I would say that it does in this sense. To say that your body is a temple um, means that it is a vessel that God uses for his holy purposes. So this, so, and what I, what I said earlier was that, um, that these earthly estates and these disciplines are not for your own sake, but for, for the sake of your neighbor. So to say your body is a temple means that God is going to use you and your body to serve other people. That's and that the Holy Spirit dwells in you not only for your sake, <laughs> but for the sake of those around you. Does that make sense, Richard? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, Walt, and then I'll, I'll swing back. If you if you read on in uh, Second or First Timothy, there, if you yep. read six to eight, it right. basically covers this whole subject. Um, and you even about bodily training. Yep. You know, it's good for it's good it's good, but godliness is better because it leads to eternal life. Right. And if you circle back up uh, at the top part, it talks about the reason you do this is for your brothers. Right. And that's that's exactly yeah. So six to eight, since he brings it up, I'll just read it. If you put these things before the brother, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we fight and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. And goes on. So there you get this, you get this, this sense of any time I'm looking at these things, because I am I am here now in the world, but I'm also a citizen of uh, a citizen of, of heaven, that I uh, that I have, if you will, dual citizenship. Um, that means that I that these two things are always are always kind of in, in interplay and sometimes in tension with one another. But that that tension does not have to be bad. Right? Don't get music on a violin without tension. So tension is not necessarily a bad thing. Too much tension, though, it's going to snap. All right. Any other questions before I before I go on? I get another page. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we're continuing our skim of Genesis 3, 14 to 24, but also looking at John 8, 44. So if you guys can look that up for me, if someone read it for me, that would be Dan. The question is, what has the devil's rebellion and the revolt of the evil angels brought into this world? This should not be a hard question for us. I hope. John 8, 44. Maybe I wrote it down wrong. You are of our father the devil. There you go. And your will is to do your father's desires. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. This is a murderer from the beginning. Nothing you do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. He lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. No. So so the lie is at the heart of the devil's of the devil's work. And so we get another a couple other descriptions there. Murderer. So so the devil does not want life but death and harm to come upon us. As a, as a result, and of course, we also see that in uh, in Genesis in Genesis three. This is this is really the uh, uh, God's uh, curse of the serpent is where that is where that begins. And this uh, this has the uh, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, and uh, you will uh, he will crush your head and he will bruise his 
and you will bruise and steal that, that verse of, of our Lord's coming. All right. Let's go on. That one was an easy one. This one's a little longer, though. Job 1. There's a couple of sections in Job there. Luke 13 and 2 Corinthians 12. So, first couple rows, rows here do the Job 1. The, the second, second two rows do the Luke verses. And then the back two rows do the 2 Corinthians. Job 1, 13 to 22. This is kind of interesting. This is, a, this is the, the, if I recall correctly, um, this is the devil trying to put God on the spot about, uh, about Job.
the devil believes that the law is his tool. So, so this is where the devil will say, you know what God's word says. You know that you've broken it. You know that, you're, that you deserve to be in hell with me. You know, just pointing at Rod because he's so convenient. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, but that's, the, that's how Satan seeks to use the law to, to point and to accuse. All right? And what, what the devil does not understand is that God uses even Satan in his proclamation of the law. My favorite Luther quote, even the devil is God's devil. That, that concept that, okay, so Satan is going to do God's work in proclaiming the law, which is sort of an interesting mind bender. And that's, and that's what you get. If so, so that when Satan does his, does his work, what he thinks is his work of accusing and driving us to despair, what he has actually done is done God's work of preparing your heart to receive the gospel. As I said, it's a bit of a mind bender. But, uh, but it's a, a, that's a really, really important thing to get kind of straight in our head. When we talk about when we talk about law and gospel, is that the devil believes that he can use the law to get to his purpose, but God uses even the devil's work for his for God's purposes, which I find frankly profoundly comforting <laughs> to know that even when the devil is doing his works, God is still in charge. Anybody's head explode over that? <laughs> Probably a couple. Ada? Well, I was reading that Satan appeared before God. Yeah. With the sons of God? Yeah. Is he a puppet? Yeah, as I said, it, there's the, this picture that we get in the beginning of Job of this sort of heavenly courtroom. Is, it's really an odd one, and we don't get any great answers or descriptions. Because we get sons of God, which really, reading the context, looks to me like we're talking about the angels, but that that's a different that's a different phrase for it. I don't have any answers for that because I'm not doing a study on Job here. <laughs> if they want to do a study on Job, we can. It might be depressing, but I'm good at depressing. So. <laughs> All right, Luke 13, 11 to 16. Luke 13, 11, 16. That's an interesting one. 13, 11, 16. Anybody have it for us?
and we don't really know much about it other than that she, it was a disabling spirit. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Um, I have always thought that back problems were satanic. <laughs> and I'm glad to see that God's word agrees with me. Um, and so she comes to she comes to Jesus. Actually, no, she is there. Jesus goes to her when he sees her and says, Woman, you are freed from your disability. Now that's kind of interesting language, because he doesn't use the language of healing there. He uses the, the language of, of freedom. And that's actually the word that elsewhere is translated for gift. To loose, to release. And, and it's actually an incredibly accurate word to use here, because for any of you who have ever had back problems, <laughs> the description is essentially this. <laughs> that, that everything is bound up and tightened up so that you that you feel like you cannot be released, that if you that if you relax, that the pain is going to be unendurable. That's been my experience with back problem at least. And so the, the picture of Jesus saying, you are released from this, is really a good one, I, I think. But that is also, the, and that's why when we talk about sin, that sin, that Jesus releases us from sin because we are bound in our sins so that we love them and hate them at the same time. That's kind of the picture that you get and that Jesus releases our glory. I've been noticing that, that the title of the little section in this Bible is called The Woman with the Disabling Spirit. Yeah. And back problems can be caused by falls or fractures. Sure. Or back problems can also be caused by stress right. and internal things. All sorts of causes. So back. it seems that maybe he's not that maybe he's healing her spirit. That's, and, and that's the interesting thing about looking at the healing episodes of Jesus, is that, is that when we look at, at sickness, kind of broadly speaking, this is, a, this is a rabbit hole that I pray that we can get out of. But, but it's an interesting one, and I, so I think it's worth going down, or at least looking into for a little bit. When we look at sickness and disease, we tend to think of we tend to think of sickness and disease as as purely a physical or physiological problem. Okay? Why did your why are you having back problems? Well, I fell on the sidewalk. Okay? So that's a nice, easy, clean kind of cause and effect, right? Um, the last 30, 40 years, I think, has seen a lot of of study um, being done on the relationship between the physical and the psychological of emotion. So you mentioned you mentioned stress. I mean, one of I know that for me, um, one of my depression triggers that, that that I can you know clockwork know that something's not firing as it ought to. Right there, <laughs> that's where it shows up. Right there, which is you know not right here, but but that's where it shows up that there is a clear relationship between these other illnesses and not only physical but psychological and emotional things and the body. So we're getting a lot of that stuff that has been uh, really researched and developed. This is why our, I don't know with physical therapy 50 years ago looked nothing like physical therapy does today, or little like it. And then you add the, the element of the spiritual, of forgiveness and, and our status before God. And we, we hear in all kinds of places in the Psalms, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, etc. We hear in all kinds of places in the Psalms that there is a clear uh, you know, relationship between my spiritual status before God and my body. 
everybody tracking with me so far? Okay. So, so when we look at these things as human beings, we look at these things as physical, emotional slash psychological, spiritual. Okay. And we and so we'll have a doctor, a psychologist, and a pastor. And, and each of them are. They all go to I would say almost by necessity have to have these different people look at this sickness in different ways because none of us can, can do all of that when Jesus looks at it he sees the whole thing the whole person and I am not a physical Todd and a psychological Todd and a spiritual Todd there are not three Todds but one Todd <laughs> paraphrase the creed and so I so I have this dilemma of all of this stuff happening here when we see Jesus doing healings in the scriptures he is not looking simply at the physical or simply at the emotional psychological or simply at the spiritual this, this would be my argument but that he sees because he sees the whole person he then heals the whole person this is why, for instance, in the, in the uh, healing of the paralytic in Mark 9, you know, he sees, he sees the paralytic, and his first words are, your sins are forgiven you. <laughs> and everybody looks at him and thinks, I didn't know that sin was the problem. <laughs> and he says, which is easier for you to say, your sins are forgiven, you are rise, take up your bed and go. And so he says to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and go. And so he sees the physical and the spiritual as intimately connected together. Science today is only just starting, I would argue, to understand the interrelationship between all of those together. Because, because science can never fully grok that relationship because science is never going to have all of those pieces any more than I as a pastor I'm ever, I'm ever going to be able to do what a doctor does or what a physical therapist does or what a psychologist does. Here on Earth, we have kind of incomplete methods of healing. And when one of them, one of those pieces is missing, I would argue, it's not going to all fit together. And so we have to, as best we can, kind of look at the healing of the body and the soul and the spirit today and, and recognize God at work using these different people. When Jesus is at it, <laughs> he sees the whole he sees the whole thing. And so he heals this person. That's why uh, I think using that word free, which is the word forgive, is such an interesting one. Because there is such a, a tight relationship between the physical and the spiritual that we don't get. And furthermore, that goes the other direction because the actual point behind having this verse in this study was, was the, that verse 16. Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? So the point of that is that Satan does does have some physical power to interact with the world. And that, that and what it is, the extent of it, how how that is how that is dealt with is um, is not kind of fully kind of written up in a nice in a nice formal paper. But we we do get this picture here, we get it in Job. Get it in all kinds of places, and I would I would argue that this is that this is probably a part of what what you see happening so often with with chronic illnesses, with these with these illnesses that nobody can figure out what's going on <coughs> behind it, <laughs> and and you know that you would think with all the money that we spend in medical research that we would have the answers for everything, 
and that that is absolutely not the case. Far, far from it. Um, but I don't know. My my answer in part to that is saying, well, that's because we don't understand everything that's going on. We don't even understand everything that's going on in terms of the physical, <laughs> far less everything else along the way. <laughs> I'm glad we got all that cleared up. I'm sure there aren't any questions about that. I think that we are now out of time, but I pray that you all take these things and consider them. Next week, uh, Pastor Pro will be here and we'll and we'll uh, we'll hold forth. And I would certainly invite and encourage you to be there for that. He is always a uh, a great instructor and uh, and worth listening to. And we will pick up here in two Sundays. Let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.